episode of A Korean Crime. Today I'm going to be making chocolate fondant cupcakes. That very nearly came out very wrong. Chocolate fondant cupcakes. Don't those look good? So, oh, it's a nice simple recipe. So dress may not fit as well as I would like. You can remove me fixing myself. Don't let us forget. I just I like this dress. I felt like looking pretty. No harm in that. It's just the sleeves get in the way a little. as well. In the 1800s, a young woman named Marie Capel was found herself orphaned and was adopted age 18 by her maternal aunt. Now, her aunt didn't like her. Despite the fact that her and her aunt were at odds, Marie was taught, was well treated, and her guardians, please ignore the noise, next door is being rebuilt, um, her guardians spent, they treated her well and spent money to send her to elite schools, some of the finest. Marie took pains to make, convince her classmates that she was of the same standing as them. Now, however, once they got older, um, all the other girls were getting married off, making good matches. But Marie had a dowry of only 90,000 francs and this compared to some other people's wasn't that high of a dowry and it meant that she wasn't able to find a husband within the same with within what her family considered the right circles okay so okay you you should know by now you should know by now but, uh, okay, 80 grams of butter 200 grams of caster sugar, flour, cocoa powder, salt and baking powder. What have you got? 200 grams of plain flour, 40 grams of cocoa powder, is just as good. Come here. Quarter teaspoon of salt. Really need to get contact lenses. See, glasses don't have the anti-glare coating, so they reflect very, very well. Just why I don't wear them. And so I end up trying to peer at things to see the hell I'm reading. Okay. Here we. Every 
single one of these cake recipes has followed the same pattern. How I don't know it off by heart yet, I will never know. But then I'm not the smartest. Well, I am. I'm smart. I just, you know, don't remember the useful things. Place eight in a jug and pour and milk mixed together by hand. Doesn't have any vanilla letters. Straight away. Devour one of chocolate. Mm. 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 So, back to Marie. After a few years of having a family attempting to marry her off, she finds herself at 23, unmarried, which in the 1800s was of course considered an old maid and uh, her uncle decided that he was going to sort this. He was going to sort this out. Take matters into his own hand and get the girl married off. Um, and he engaged the services of a marriage broker. Matchmaker, basically. You gave him your details and you gave them your details and then they would match you up with someone else. It's early days of Tinder, basically. You'd put in your details, someone else would put in theirs. And then they'd match you up. You could meet, you could chat. And, you know, modern... Uh, Victorian online dating, basically. And just it's risky because, of course, people didn't always tell the truth, did they? Which is exactly what happened to Mary. Um, so, Marie's uncle, unbeknownst to her, contacts a marriage broker. At the same time, young man named Charles Lafarge was contacting the exact same marriage broker. Now Lafarge had inherited his father's estate. However, he'd attempted to set up a foundry hoping to make money from it and that had been a complete and utter failure. The uh, family home was a, a wreck, a ruin, and Charles was incredibly in debt. And so the only way out of this mess to marry a wealthy woman and use her money, i.e. her dowry, to fix his problems. Now, Lafarge didn't tell the marriage broker any of this. He stated that he had a large palatial estate and, you know, had inherited his family's wealth. He didn't mention the debts or anything else. And Marie's uncle thought that this was the perfect match. And because he hadn't told Marie about the arrangement, about getting the marriage broker involved, he arranged a Meet cute. An accidental meeting for the two of them at the opera. Um, however, Marie did not like her husband. She found Charles to be... What was the wording used? Common? Uncouth? He wasn't exactly well-bred, apparently. However, when she heard the description, when she heard the words palatial estate, she thought, ah, I'll put up with him. And they were married. There we go. So, they were married. August 10th in 1839. Now, August 13th, they arrive at the state. And Marie instantly knows 
she has been the buildings are crumbling and overrun with rats her in-laws who she saw as peasants because of their poverty instantly disliked her and then she was informed of the debt as well so. now most reports state that Charles managed to persuade her um, to not, you know, try and get a divorce or not leave him, that he wouldn't um, try and take his marital dues, as it was put in one source, until he had paid off the debt and improved her situation. Marie agreed to this and apparently they managed to develop an amicable friendship. Now, in December 1839, Charles went to Paris in an attempt to go find work and money. Marie wrote him letters of recommendation Sorry about that. Eh. Lost my spoon. I did. Just get a phone call telling me I have a new job, which is brilliant. <coughs> it's housekeeping. Which I don't mind too much. Now, where was I? Oh yes. So, 1839. They've only been married a couple of months. Charles goes to Paris in an attempt to find work and raise some money. Now, before he leaves, Marie writes a will, leaving all her belongings to him and says, like, I'll leave you everything as long as you do the same. Like, I will sign I can sign this will, leaving everything to you, so long as you do the same. Now, Charles agreed, wrote the will, and then unbeknownst to Marie, wrote his another will. Instead of leaving everything to her, he left it all to his mother. Off he goes to Paris. Now, while he's in Paris, he receives from Marie a picture of her, some passionate love letters, and a Christmas cake. Seems quite nice, quite friendly. So he eats the cake and instantly feels ill. Now, at this time in Paris, Typhoid was very common. It was so common that it was known as the Parisian illness. La maladie parisienne. And so, thinking that that must be it, he threw away the cake, thinking that it had gotten spoiled in transit, and then returned home thinking there's no point being in Paris while I'm ill if I can just go home and stay there. Who we did that. He returns home, doctor is summoned, and the doctor diagnoses him with typhoid. No one's really surprised, like I said, very common. Probably just got the Parisian illness. So, doctor comes, diagnoses him, doesn't suspect anything, even when Marie asks him for a prescription of arsenic. Now, she claimed it was for the rats. Because, of course, as we know, the place was overrun. And... Where have they gone? And they were disturbing her husband when he tried to rest at night. So the doctor gave her arsenic. And she continued to 
nurse him like a loving wife would. Soups and teas, cakes. Even she claimed was Gomorovic. She always always made her right. Made her good, I think it was. Um, and she kept a ready supply of it in a little malachite box that she kept in her pocket. Now, a cousin of the family was staying with them and her companion was also with her. And they were helping watch over Charles because he just seemed to be getting worse and worse. And this companion, Anne, sees Marie sprinkle some white powder from the matchbox into a glass of eggnog. Is this eggnog? Um, and when asked what it was, Marie said, it's sugar blossom water. Make it taste nice. Um, but after a couple of mouthfuls, Charles once again started feeling even worse than he had before. So Anne is suspicious and she takes away the glass she keeps it to the side, puts it in a cupboard, keeps it safe and keeps watching basically. Now, a few days later she went to something the doctor comes and she's like look okay he started drinking this and then he felt worse. I think there's something in it. The tasted it and did experience what was referred to as a burning sensation. However, he didn't think much of it and said that the white flakes floating on top were just some ceiling plaster that must have fallen in. Understandable, the place was falling apart. It happened with some soup, etc. And eventually, Anne plucked up the courage. And each of these things that she saw being given to Charles and then him feeling worse afterwards, she would take away the unfinished portion and keep it in a cupboard where Marie didn't know, couldn't see it. And eventually she plucked up the courage to speak to his family. Um, now, the second doctor was called, he diagnosed typhoid as well, and however, his Charles' family tried to persuade him to, to not accept anything that his wife gave him. Um, and they became even more alarmed when they heard that Marie had, um, purchased arsenic, or at least she'd gotten the, uh, the gardener to purchase arsenic for her. And when confronted, Marie was like, oh no, 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 no. I gave that back to the gardener to make up a paste for the rats. Like, we're, we're playing with rats. Come on. Come on. Okay, it was for the rats. And everyone was like, okay, right, fair point. Give it back to the gardener. I mean, I don't know. And the gardener confirmed this. However, a few days later, a white powdery substance was found at the bottom of a glass of sugar water that had been fed to Charles. And another doctor was called. And that doctor confirmed their suspicions of poisoning. 
However, it was too late because a few hours later, Charles died. Now, the evidence was brought forth, the poisoned food the town had kept, the prescriptions she'd gotten from different doctors, and Aunt and Marie was accused of poisoning her husband. She was also very unhappy when she went to the bank with the will that he'd signed, only to find out that that wasn't his will and he'd written another one. Now, with this one, unlike with the previous recipes where we would wait for the cakes to cook and then while they cooled we would make the icing, this one has ganache icing which needs to be left to cool before you can use it. So we are going to make that while these bake and then they can all cool together. Drop it on the packet, it makes less mess. Hopefully. Now, Marie was prosecuted. And her case is quite well known. Mainly because it was one of the first murder cases that the public followed through daily news reports it was also one of the first cases where the conviction was brought around through the use of forensic evidence to test the body for arsenic as well as the food that was kept aside by the clever ant. Just think, if she hadn't suspected Marie, if she hadn't been as clever as she was and thought to keep the the sus the suspicious food, they would barely have had a case against it. But only because of Anne, being a plucky young woman, it was basically cut and dry. Um, now, first day of the trial, Marie appears in court, sniffing into a handkerchief and in full widow's clothing. And instantly, instantly, the public was split into pro-Marie and anti-Marie. Despite all 
this and despite her always up until her death excuse me claiming her innocence she was sentenced to many years in prison with hard labor however the judge took pity on her and changed this from hard labour to just the imprisonment. So now we are going to make the ganache. Our cream is nice and hot. Probably got melted chocolate on the bottom of it and then we just pour that over the top of our chocolate. Just stir till it's all melted and nice and smooth. As you can see, we got some lovely chocolate soup. Now, the cakes are also done. And as you can see, I overfilled them again. Again. I, 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 I do this every time. <sighs> but the ganache is pretty good. So we need to wait for both of these to cool. And then we can put them together. Okay, so our cakes are all nice and cool. We have cut out a small segment like we did with the tiramisu ones. So they've got a nice little hollow so we can fill. And this time, unlike with the tiramisu ones, I kept all the tops and bottoms together so I don't have to then play jigsaw puzzle. Now the ganache is nice and thick and cooled. I'm going to go around and fill them all first. And then I can frost them. So, yeah, you just basically fill up your little holes. You can, if needs be, remove the bottom from your little lid bit. Um, if you need to, in order to make it sit flat. Some of these are not going to sit flat. Because, as always, I overfilled the cases. Now, it's just to fill it halfway up. You want, you want a decent amount of filling. You don't want to be stingy on your filling. It's just, a, it's just disappointing. You bite into a cupcake and you think, cool, this is going to have a nice chocolatey filling. You've got a tiny little nibble. And it's just disappointing. Like a good teaspoon. I know I'm using a tablespoon. It handles a little bit longer, which means it's a little less messier for my hand. I'll take my friend. Nice. I know, I know. How do I know they don't watch this? I know they don't watch this. Chocolate fondant cupcakes. Don't they look good? <laughs> so, this is a very nice and simple chocolate cake with a dark chocolate ganache filling and frosting. 
of topping. Now, the taste test. I should. I've got to be sensible. I never am. I always make a mess. I don't think anybody actually watches these to see me make a mess. So, it's very rich. Personally, I'd rather milk chocolate or half and half on top. If I was going to do them again, I think I'd do half and half. Because the dark chocolate is very rich, quite bitter. But the filling does give a nice moistness to the cake. And um, definitely an idea for a full size cake. I'm the final cake, the ganache on top, and the ganache in the middle. So, um, Thank you for joining me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the story of Marie Lafarge. All my sources, all the links I used are in the bio, in the description below, um, as are the links to my social, other social medias. Cookery in Crime is uploaded every second Friday, and I do, excuse me, a sweet recipe and a savoury recipe. Um, I also post musical videos every Monday which is usually me singing covers of musical theatre songs and pop songs. Any requests or suggestions for that, do let me know. So um, that's everything for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll, I'll see you on Monday for Musical Mondays.